questions. Hey, Busy Bees, this is Heather Kate, the Buzz Queen with Honey Bee Buzz Modern Marketing. And I'm here today with Paige LaBella, who is one of the most amazing women I know. She's had a very interesting career and currently is deeply into horses and hopefully I'll say this correctly, equitation. Um, but it has to do with the, um, uh, I'll have Paige explain it better, but the, the, the physical movement of horses so that they can um, do a really beautiful job. Um, she also has some interesting ideas on how that applies to people. And um, I want to mention that she started life, young life, as um, an engineer, um, became a motorcycle racer, woohoo, girl, and um, and then she's lived in a very interesting bunch of places across the country. So I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit about um, what that was like, how she's used these different aspects of, of life and applied it to different situations. Um, and I'll give you just a little bit of background about me. Uh, my first job out of college was at the Children's Museum in Boston as an exhibit um, interpreter and designer. I then went to Croatia and was director of communications and did logistics and fundraising for a humanitarian relief group during their war. Then I worked for Sylvania the light bulb company as a senior industrial engineer and short version then I started my own um, marketing firm. So I do websites and social media marketing, copywriting PR, um, and I have been having a lot of fun lately interviewing some really interesting people. So today I present to you Paige LaBella. Hello. Hi. So nice to see you. Wonderful to see you. <laughs> So yeah. tell me, um, where did you go to school and which brand of engineering degree do you have? Well, I started at Wentworth Institute of Technology in electronic engineering technology. And I did the two-year degree there and just did not want to continue with electrical. Um, started mechanical there, but they advised me to go on for a full calculus, full-blown uh, BSME. And I switched over to UMass. And so I finished up my Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering at UMass. Then went into chromatography, automobile industry. So I have about a decade in engineering. So engineering um, cars? Where did where does cars. chromatography and cars come together and engineering? Well, chromatography was a co-op type job that I got and I actually, when I look back, that would have been a fun industry to stay in, but I had said my second love to horses was cars. And so ah, I was also ah. a motorhead as a youth. Right. We, we grew so, up in the same town, but I didn't know this. The horses I knew, absolutely. I did not know the motorhead part. And I have to say, I think- Oh, little, little Paige used to talk the high school boys into letting her drive their car. Oh, yes. good for you. Oh. Yes, and so we'll just say John C. We won't mention the last name, but um, uh, he liked to drive fast. He's from a well-known. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Trying to think who that is. Oh, oh. So there was a few. <laughs> I may have may have <laughs> left a donut like on the. Um, May have driven a donut on the football field and gotten the owner of that car in trouble. Really? <laughs> Ow! That might, have, that might have been me when I was a freshman. I don't really? know. Really? Oh, Rotten kid. No. <laughs> no. The no. poor boy, he stood up and took the blame for me because he'd have been in deeper trouble for letting a 13-year-old <laughs> drive his car. <laughs> right? Really? No, 14. 14 as a freshman, right? I graduated at 17. Yeah, so 14. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Right. So, yeah. Take away my horses and I'm trouble. Mm. So I was, I was out of competition, showing competition by then, by high school. So, yes, it was cars after that. So then when I went to college, the cars, that's what I really wanted to do. I also did an internship at um, 
Rowley Corvette. It was my next door neighbor's daughter's husband, and he was building Ferrari replica cars. Ooh. And so I got Wentworth to let me do an, in, uh, uh, what do you call it? Internship? Internship. Yeah. There. Oh, wow. So that was fun. Yeah, then chromatography was really cool because, like, everything you learn in engineering, none of that applies when you're pumping fluid through 5,000 inner diameter tubing. So that was kind of neat. So Very cool what, stuff. What is chromatography? Chromatography is, so I was in high-pressure liquid chromatography on the, on the side of designing and developing the pumps for that system, but... What chromatography does, and I'm talking, I'm not up to date on my chromatography. This is back then. Give us um, a general, what is chromatography? What, what it did was it would use light, so that's the chroma, um, to analyze a liquid down right down to the molecular level. So you'd get a little printout with little spikes that would tell you each molecule in that liquid. Ooh. Pretty cool. So for, for so then you start understanding why parts per million of some poison is allowed in your food because because it is because it's a very very tiny tiny amount. It's out there, <laughs> right? Yeah, you, that stuff skeeves you out. You don't want to look at these printouts. <laughs> were you testing? What were you testing? We were testing the pumps, so I was on, on okay. the team that was working on the pump side of it. But we had to get, um, we had to put fluids through and send the, the printouts up to the, the PhDs upstairs to analyze. And what so were we they? put known stuff. Oh. <laughs> just for that. Yeah, accuracy, repeatability. So you yeah. worked for the company that made them, and they made them for other companies or the government or yep 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 research hospitals um oh, right it was used in a highly publicized trial um wow. of the 80s the chromatography so the public kind of got to hear about chromatography because of that trial that was on everybody's tv it what trial was the, that um, well there was a white bronco <laughs> Yeah, that was the thing I was thinking right. of. Right. Like, oh, no, that couldn't be. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We talked about chromatography. I was like, yes. Oh. So, and then I talked to scientists that I know now and asked them, and, and they actually use the equipment that this oh. company that I work for made. So it's, oh, cool. So it's still they don't sell a lot of machines. They sit in research, right. you know, universities and wherever. Yeah. Yeah. So. But that was, that was a really cool job. I appreciate it now. But I couldn't wait to get out of there and get into the automotive industry. So, I, okay. And then auto was just boring. Oh, no! What did you do? Isn't that funny? Yes. Well, well they had the, the, but yeah. the, the jobs were so compartmentalized, so small. So I entered at, in Saturn Corporation as a what was I? Advanced Vehicle Service Engineer. So my job was to um, oversee serviceability of a small chunk of parts that I own. So they broke the car up into parts. Yep. So I had some interior trim parts, like door handles, and you wouldn't believe how nitpicky every little detail. There are so many little tiny parts in the car. And so that's how they broke it up by parts. So that was boring. <laughs> I, I stayed there for a few years. Paige likes a challenge. Paige has a brain. Yeah. That. So I moved into, um, I moved from Saturn to General Motors in um, fuel system development. And I got myself out to the proving grounds and actually got to do some driving out there. So that was fun. That must have been it's real still cool. a little bit. It was cool. That got me a trip to Australia. We had an emergency project. We had to immediately increase the fuel tank volume of a particular model, and we had to go through the hot weather testing, and it was December. So where is it hot in December? And dry and flat. Alice Springs, Australia. So we got... <laughs> We got 10 cars shipped down there, fuel, everything we needed, a team of about 10 people. 
And we Ooh. parked our butts there. Cool. How long were For you there? For almost a month. It was hot. Oh, yeah. Not hot. I've never seen such hot. Oh, Where wow. things combust from the sun. That's warm. Right? That's a little too That's warm, warm for me. Yeah. <laughs> we watch a rag on the ground. We would take apart like a fuel line and the dribble of fuel. We'd use a paper towel to just capture the dribble of fuel. And then that, you throw that on the pavement. And you turn around and you look and you see, you don't see flame, but you see burn. It's turning black and that's creeping in. It's like, wow, oh, that's hot, hot, hot place. I think that's beyond sunscreen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> stay hydrated, stay covered. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, we got our hot weather testing done and got that fuel tank. Cool. increased Ooh, wait. So, awesome all yeah. right then what then what where'd you go after that then what then i got the motorcycle bug so i did have motorcycles but it was about what 96 when i started at gm i got my first sport bike so yep. i got a ninja 900 cool. and um had you been riding immediately i wanted did you ride i was yeah okay mm -hmm. back growing yeah. up were just sort of it was after high school okay after high school yeah I ha I was playing with cars and I would buy and sell and I had a car somebody traded me I had a Trans Am and I got two cars and a motorcycle for that so my first motorcycle I you know snuck up on it like that okay. and then I was scared of it and it sat in my garage and I lived up on a hill. So my first ever ride was going to be down, <laughs> down a steep driveway Dirt. on a thing that I couldn't reach, right? I couldn't reach the ground on it. So I worked up my nerve and I did it. So then I was riding. <laughs> but well, then you up the driveway at the very least, right? <laughs> the uphill's easy. It was the downhill stop and then turn thing that scared me so we got it we got it and that my road you couldn't look up the road you had to stop it would have been easier to just roll through the stop but you the trees you had to stop so i didn't like stopping because i couldn't reach the ground right so it's like they, one of those hover stops and go <laughs> well or, or yeah tiptoes yeah. and those things are really stable when they're rolling Right, but not right. when they're standing still. <laughs> so, so I had the motorcycle interest. So you okay? So you yep. So I, you bought a sport. I wanted to race cars. I really wanted to race cars, and there was a guy in Hamilton that took me out on some probably the the lowest entry level way to race cars was what was it called enduro or endurance or something? You just take a junkyard car, just junkyard cars. You don't want to spend any money on them. You just drive them until they die i don't know so i did that a couple times yeah it was fun but racing i wanted to do and cars are very expensive to race so i found out that motorcycles you're only paying for two tires and they're much better on fuel and you know it was half maybe half the cost so i had that in my head and then one of the engineers at gm was a little bit encouraging he had raced as a younger man and he kind of egged me on a little bit and um i found some guys so these are my you talked about croatia there were two guys from croatia who i met yeah yeah riding and and we used to all ride together and they oh. told me that i needed to get on the track yeah so, so oh, they we brought me to some track stuff and they took you to track we rode on the road really open it up we rode way too fast yeah, we rode way too fast on the road. Okay, so, so yeah, if it's not going to cause you any legal liability, what's the fastest you went on a road? 187. Go, chica! Woohoo! Right, no. Who's going to, you know? Because I had, this was recently, not recently, but more recently than that, but it was a um, GSXR 1000 and its top speed is 187 because oh. it's governed. Oh. Right, there's a fuel cut off or electronics cut off or something, but yes, I did get it there. Yes. And 
And that was on the highway. What's the fastest you went on a track? Same or on the track, not that fast. So on the track, I rode a lightweight superbike. And I probably the track is what depends on the is what determines the speed, right? So these are road courses, not not just drags, you know, not straights. So I'm gonna guess that. I never hit a speedo on the race bike because those are distracting. They advise against it, so I didn't have one. But uh, probably 150, probably Texas World Speedway was well. Texas Motor Speedway I rode on. I only had one race there, and they for some reason took that away. The banking on that on that track with the bikes. The banking. You understand how the banking works on these tracks? I. I mean, I, I have if, a, I think maybe the I faster you go, the faster you go, the higher you go up on the banking. So on Texas Motor Speedway, the banking goes up here. We're down here. So we're not, they're going 200 miles an hour plus when they're up on the top. The car. So we're down pretty low. The G forces on that track was smashing me into the gas tank and I, my chest hurt. My sternum was bruised from that so i don't know how fast we're going but ow <laughs> yeah cool so all right fun but it's something you don't you know it's not like i just all of a sudden went fast one day that's something you work up to that's a fear you face responsibly right you start smooth and then i started teaching and teaching like racing her. right really yeah See? Audience, I tell Another you, every thing. time I talk with Paige, I learn something <laughs> additional cool. Every time, every time. This is so awesome. <laughs> okay. So, so this that is was fun. Um, <laughs> there were only a handful of us females racing on the track, and so the, the teaching organizations kind of wanted to have us represented, and so I got asked to teach. And as a track instructor, right? And what... The, Women approach it differently, smarter. Yeah. Guys go out there all gung-ho and want to be the fast guy right now. And a lot of them learn the hard way. And on motorcycles, they're not forgiving. You don't get to make mistakes. You make little ones, but you don't get to make a big mistake. So mm. often, there was one guy who was a friend of mine, and he shouldn't have been my student, but he was. And the, the rule on the track with the instructor is the instructor's gonna turn around and wave. And when they wave, you do not try to follow them. They are going to catch up to their next student, right? To show them, they'll slow down for the okay. students, show them They're some lines running. around the track, and yeah, we slowly build up the speed a little bit, right? And then wave them off and go get the next one. Well, this guy tried to keep up, and he, he hurt himself real bad. He broke an ankle. He went flying off. Oh, it was bad. He wadded the bike up. He went flying. He broke an ankle and a wrist. So yeah, it's not. You have to. You have to be smooth first. And I think that goes with anything. I think that goes with anything. You don't just attack it. You get hurt if you do on motorcycles. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> maybe this is about life in general. Maybe that's my problem. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So so cool. So, so then, so then, what was your next career slash life step? Okay. So that I started the racing when I was an engineer with GM, and, and I was in. Huh. You were living in Texas at that time. I was living in Oklahoma. So I had moved from the Proving Grounds to Oklahoma assembly plant. And I honestly, at that point, felt like I wasn't loving how the big corporation worked. And I could not see how that company could stay alive. It really looked like to me, it, like it was crashing and burning. That's GM. You know, it sort of and it did it. much later. It's but, So I took a, um, okay. I, there's a, someone, Nicholas Taleb. I, seem, I don't know if I said his name right. Um, but anyway, he calls it the FU money. I took the FU money and left. Oh. <laughs> I knew they were, I knew they were um, 
uh, offering payouts to get rid of people and they wouldn't give it to me and I kept telling them really? I want this and I knew if I really pushed through um, HR they would probably kind of have to so they did they they did it for me so I got out of there and I moved to Texas all excited about motorcycles I opened up a little bike shop and I kept racing I actually had one race on the track so on the street I was always at the in the back and it never ever occurred to me that when you're the last rider you're riding faster than everybody else because they'll gap you and then you have to go faster than them to catch up so I'm always catching up going faster than them never occurred to me till decades later but I had one of those races on the track where I I blew the start I stalled I usually had a really good start so I blew the start, the whole field went, and I stayed there, got the bike started and went. I pulled some lap times that were within a very close range of lap records, and there was a race team owner up in the tower watching, and he pulled me off the track, off the pits, and he said, what? <laughs> I want you to ride this bike. He put me on his bike. Anyway, he, long story short, because this will go forever. Okay. Um, he, right. well, we'll have to detail later. <laughs> he, he created a women's um, endurance team. So we were there were three of us on that team. Wow! But endurance. But team. that was a one-off. Yeah, Our endurance racing is they're long races, anywhere from four to eight hours, and you have oh a team. So there's pit the stops and yes, around a road course, so turns, you know. Right. Yeah, so oh, I was wow. on one of those. We were, we were, not, we were mediocre, you know, but it was fun. Um, that was a one-off, me going that fast, because I was in the back. And I, if I had stayed with racing longer, I may have worked through the psychology of that. I did not like to lead a race. I could start out in the front. But I didn't want to lead because I just didn't have the experience and the confidence to. Um, know how fast I could go without exploding, <laughs> crashing, right? So that comes with time. That comes with time and experience. So I, so know I was in over my head. On the opposite end of who, not too surprisingly, probably a, a guy who's on the opposite end of that spectrum or the other side of that coin who, um, uh, wants to be first no matter what and will do whatever it takes and has had you know he he raced motorcycles and had some of those awful injuries he didn't care he just, he yeah. just kept doing it um right and uh uh i think it's a, a i think it's a, i think it is an interesting psychology and you know where do you want to be and how do you yeah. want to get there and it's uh i think it's kind of fascinating but Okay, so I raced, I raced beside a guy like that. So it was me in my 30s, and this guy was like 17 or 18, but he, um, he just wanted to win. For me, it was I wanted to improve my skill and improve my lap times and all that. And I would have a faster lap time, and he would have a better finish. <laughs> so yeah. he was, and he would race a little dirty. He put yeah. his tire across. That's exactly it. He put his tire across another guy. There were three of us that were always up front, two boys and me. And this one kid, he did, he did some dangerous stuff. So considering that we can all die out there, you know, you, you kind of have to try to race fair, and that doesn't always happen. I have a dog wrapping his leg in my power cord. There we go. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's... There's always bickering about in the in the higher ranks of racing, of dirty racing and all that. But so yeah, I have my list list of injuries from from racing as well as horseback riding. And yeah, most of the serious injuries were racing. I had a couple of good head hits too, a couple oh, really? of good concussions, even in the seven hundred dollar helmets. Yes, so. Yes, the helmets, and I learned later, the helmets don't, don't prevent the brain injury. They just prevent yeah, the skull injury? Brain. They prevent the skull injury that can cause a brain injury, but they don't prevent the brain injury. And Stanford University has some really good research going on on that. 
and then but yeah, it's a shearing a shearing team. force inside the huh the football team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The brain the brain does this. It's jello, and it does this inside, and the lesion Wait, the finding is in the of your brain move independently. Well, it's yeah. They, they it's jello. It's like jello, so it does this, and it's in here where the lobes are attached deep in the middle where they find the lesion. So they get to watch the football players. They get to replay how their heads are hit. And they're looking at how these injuries happen. So, yeah. Wow. There's some cool stuff out there. Someone has a helmet that has little sliders on it. So the hits are the, these. It's this that they're pointing at that is one of the biggest causes of the brain injury so the helmet has sliders on it so, so that they'll take the ah. so they'll move they move the the helmet has moving parts so the parts move to reduce the movement of the head anyway cool so wow i'm waiting for the good equestrian helmet to come out oh well maybe <laughs> <laughs> that's your new business <laughs> yeah <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> Just the can. <laughs> so okay, <laughs> so you went from motorcycle racing to then what? So I went to the. I opened up the bike shop, but I'm not real strong in retail. And um, yeah, it happened. Well, 2007 was about when I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, and that's about when the economy was crashing. So, I mean, I maybe would have been able to stay afloat in like a perfect economy and da, da, da. but internet sales were starting to really ramp up and their business model was make a $5 profit on every single thing, who cares? And I could, you couldn't hold a um, bricks and mortar store open on that. So anyway, I gave up and uh, got into a right of way business. What is that? That's a whole different thing, right? What is that? There's not many right-of-way professionals in the world. It's, it's, we go out and we purchase land rights for utilities, for pipelines, okay. for, right? So oh, that's before, you I was actually like on one of the controversial ones, one of the controversial projects out front. So we go out, we take the um, asset owner's map, they draw a line on a map and we go find out who owns that land, what the value of that land is, blah, blah, blah. I go out and knock on doors, try to buy the land or buy an easement across the land. So, and then report back what the sentiment is of the public on this project and yada, yada. So we're the upfront, that upfront part of it. Well, that was tough. Yeah. That was tough. And you were out in a so, rural area, if I remember correctly, where land is is deep in people, and um, and it's an important part of living life, not just like making a living and yes. somewhere else, but it's like it's a thing. And um, yes, and I can imagine that you were out there in the middle of nowhere. Were you by yourself? I mean, everybody has a gun, at least one. Probably right. Right. So sometimes, yeah, yeah, I went out al alone a lot. Yeah, to strangers' houses. Uh, yeah, so well, that's <laughs> the strangers' houses, but people that do not want to talk to you, probably. And actually, the only time I saw a gun was on a municipal project. So I did see gun on a municipal project where they just wanted to make a bike path. Right, so that's the other side of this. It's not all, you know, pipelines and stealing people's land. This is a, a city, city lots. They wanted to widen the, um, the road to put a bike path in. And this man was so offended that he, he, yeah, he had a gun for our meeting. Yeah. So then I reported that back to the, to the municipality and to my team, and we suddenly had some gun training. Oh. An active shoot. We got we got the active shooter training because of that. He wasn't a shooter. He was just a, he was a just a guy trying to intimidate. So anyway, okay. again, another cool thing about you. You 
was just trying to be intimidating. What was he thinking? <laughs> Uh, so I was nervous and I kept my, um, I kept my body so that I could scoot out of where I was and I knew where the door was and I always had, you know, I wasn't going to let him drag me deep into a place where I couldn't get out. I talked, I directly write about his gun, the first thing I talked about, and we talked about guns. So I, the elephant in the room, I'm going to talk about it. So I did. <laughs> and that was that. And we went about our meeting. <sighs> and then I decompressed <laughs> afterwards. That's I cool. Told wow. the appropriate people. <laughs> yeah. So, it, so go with your gut on that. I, I, the guy from talking to him, I knew he was just a blowhard. He was just that kind of guy. He's just mad. He was an angry person. He was, you know, grumpy about this thing, flexing his muscles. He felt like the city was taking advantage of him and I represented the city. So he was going to show me, but yeah, it, it was, gut. it was a gut feeling that said, I, this guy's just posturing. So. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Holy moly. Okay. okay. So if I remember correctly, you said you did the right of way stuff a couple of times and sort of retired from that, was that, or something like that, and then? I play, I say I retired. I retired from GM, and then I retired from right of way, and then I rejoined it. So I was on right of way for a few years on projects. Um, I did a project in Texas, and then I did a project in South Dakota, and then I retired, and I bought my horse farm. And then I found a local office in right of way in Iowa. <laughs> so that's where I did the municipal projects oh, yeah. and um, electricity transmission line projects. So they're all rebuilding the um, electricity infrastructure. Start so up a little bit or? Well, it's just, it's old infrastructure. So we're seeing in the news, a lot of these, you know, power failures were yeah so they're upgrading the poles the conductors the capacity yes. right i would think we'd need a lot more capacity than we started. and they're adding a lot yeah when they're rebuilding these they're adding they're increasing capacity too so yep cool so that that was that horses horses will the one way to make a small fortune in horses is to start with a large fortune, but I'll, I'll, that's, you know. So yes, the horses, <laughs> the big horse farm and all of that. I, it started as an idea to not have a horse of my own, but just to get back close to them, right? And board, I was just gonna not board horses for other people. Of your own, but have, so, okay, so we skipped over the first part of that. We won't go into detail with, with Paige's background, bloodline of her own upbringing and passion but she's a horse woman and i can't yeah. believe that's that's okay that is this is not a fair comparison but that is like me owning a candy shop and saying i'm not gonna eat any chocolate <laughs> right so but this is how you trick yourself into doing things okay. so um i said yep i'm just gonna i'm gonna get this farm it's a um it's a currently operating boarding facility that cash flows a little bit so we're just going to stay on the business level not going to get attached to any horses here <laughs> right That's so kind caring yeah. compassionate careful adventurous woman <laughs> so i did i i i of course ended up getting horses and all that the boarding was tough um there was some, there was one really ugly personality in that barn that made the boarding really difficult. And so I said, you know what? I was teaching. I made a lot more money teaching lessons. And actually when I bought the farm, I was subsidizing the boarders. So I was paying about $25 a month for each boarder. And so, right, because of the rate the previous owner had set was very low. She oh. probably had no mortgage. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> so 
I was like, you know, contemplating this. How do I, right? The rates around town were that low, but I increased the services because I just couldn't, I couldn't not clean stalls every single day and I couldn't not feed them the appropriate amount of hay. So I increased the feeding, I increased the care, and then I increased the um, board. And uh, some of them got offended and left, which was fine because I still wasn't going to make money off of them. I needed the lessons. So the lessons was what kept me going as, I, as the borders sort of dwindled off. And that was peaceful. Then I didn't have to deal with all that drama. They complained about me using my arena. And I, yeah, it was one. It was one who was real trouble. Um, Somebody and if I knew now. In your own arena to teach classes or something? Yeah, they didn't like. She she had issues. She had issues, and I was trying. She had she had survived a cancer, so I was trying to um, be very patient and very polite with her. And um, I, that's hard, you know. This woman just survived cancer, but she's being so ugly to me. What do you do? <laughs> so uh -huh. I just let them decide to leave themselves. So. They did. She and her husband both left. They actually even brought a horse without even asking me. They just brought another horse to my facility and put it in a stall. I'm like, what? You don't get to do that. <laughs> there, are, there are contracts. Oh, yeah, they would pay. You know, but they never asked. They never made the arrangements. They never signed the contract. They just, I think they were used to kind of running the show there or thinking they were. Or I have no idea. what. That's they, why the other person sold the farm. No, I'm just <laughs> she yeah maybe that could be <laughs> no the other person I think needed to get out of the cold and you said eventually it was, it, was, it was it was excruciatingly cold there like ridiculous wasn't it like did, did you I, those, of like throwing a pan of water and it froze in midair or something like that like sh chucking the that wasn't me no okay it no, was, but I, I did do it because I couldn't fathom taking my glove off to run a camera to do that. But it works. Oh. <laughs> it does work. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it was very cold. It was hard. It was hard to keep going with the horses and with me. And so what I've learned through what I'm doing now with the equine biomechanics is that we need to keep moving. And when I let myself down or let the horses down for a couple months, it's hard coming back. So me with all my injuries and then my horses with their, you know, they're older and um, we've rehabilitated them through some pathologies. And when they get that much time off, I was afraid I was going to lose one of them. <gasps> so, right. Uh. So <laughs> I know if I keep her moving, she's fine. So that's part of what motivated me, my babies, that I wasn't uh, getting by, right? Oh, uh, yeah. So, but yeah, so the, I ended up when I decided that I wasn't going to try to get any more borders, I said, well, I better get a job. So I got a job that I can work from home. And um, I did that and the training. So it worked out well. What, what's the, the horse job? training? The, teaching. the what? What's the job? I lost you. Oh, what is the job that you did or do from home? The job I did from home was the right-of-way work for the municipalities oh, wow. and the transmission line. Yeah, because we're out in the field, out knocking on doors and talking to people and negotiating contracts and all of that at, at landowners' homes. So working from home was a good option. Yes. So that, yes, that worked really well. That is cool. And so I was sad to let that go, but I needed to get away from the cold. So now I'm retired again. Has more of it. <laughs> she says. <laughs> um, but do you find that, the, that the, the warmer climate where you are now is easier on the old aches and pains, the old break points? It's easier. I wasn't handling the cold well. My feet frostbit. So, and that may be linked to um, frostbite as a child. 
horse showing in the cold, right? So I had a pretty good frostbite when I got delivered home from a weekend of horse showing. Um, and that might be Ouch. just damage that was done then. So a little more susceptible. I think maybe. That's what they, they I don't know. They but I, say. Yeah. So, yep, it wasn't. I, so I was staying in the house too much. I'd get it, go out, do what I had to do, and come right back in. So I was not active. And being inactive hurts me. I have to keep moving. Yeah. If I stop, I'm, <laughs> I need to keep moving. So, and you told me yes. something really interesting yesterday about um, uh, biomechanics, that you used posture to help repair some of your, your you said I said, that, not just your back, but your elbow, knees, and was there something else also? Everything. Everything. Shoulders. And that's just from posture. Everything people. hurt. Po well, it's, that's maybe oversimplified. It's posture and motion. And um, so for me, and that comes from, I have now a foundation of understanding of equine biomechanics. And a lot of that transfers. So it, when I say it's just posture, it's that's standing on top of this foundation. <laughs> and I started that, I started looking into it on my own probably eight years ago. And then in about 20, late 2013, 2014, I found a really good source of information and have just been absorbing and building on that since. But posture is a big one. For the shoulders, I had to, I had to get my posture to where my shoulders were hanging my arms in the right place. And then the way you know it works is then the arms go up now. I mean, there was a time when I couldn't do that. I could not do that. It hurt really bad. I had a period of time where my back was killing me. Um, herniated lumbar discs and I won't do surgery and I won't do pain pills. So um, herniated lumbar with a, which one? This one I dislocated racing. This one I did some serious damage in the rotator cuff. I couldn't sleep laying down, it hurt too much. I had to sleep sitting up for a while. Then I found um, on some physical therapy website that traction helps. So I found a way to wrap, I wrapped a sheet around my hand and around my foot and pulled that arm into traction so I could sleep. And if I held the, as long as I could hold that traction, I could sleep. It didn't hurt. So that's the term I got through that. But, uh, right, I had, horses will do that to you. You have to go out and you have to feed them and water them. You don't have an option. Hay bales are 50 pounds, feed bags are 50 pounds. So that, I mean, you have to, you have to, you can't stop. You want to live long and keep moving, get horses. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's and awesome. drain your bank accounts. And, right. So, yes. So the horses made me do it. Thank you, horses. <laughs> Yay, right? horses. Yes. But wow. then later, as I learned more about, uh, about biomechanics and um, just how these biological systems work, they're amazing. I, I didn't even, so the people that are in the, um, oh, talking myofacial release and the body workers were into this woo-woo thing about fascia and everything being all connected. Well, science caught up and said, oh, yeah, it's tensegrity. Yeah, yeah, that's real. Finally, so right? So it's caught up with things that are thousands of years old. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but with the science, we can really, really understand it. Um, so yeah, the tensegrity, tensegrity is, is the latest, my latest kick. And one thing that helps a lot that even my, my biomechanics trainer talks about is think about creating space between the vertebra. So get taller and we all say that you know riding instructors will taller get taller okay how right but he adds the element of thinking of tensegrity add space 
So your body already does that. It, it creates space between the vertebra. We think about um, bodies and loading of a body as if, you know, the bones, the, the, you think of a joint like that. Don't think of it like this, like it's pulling apart and it moves like that. And the muscle and tendon and fascia and all of that is keeping that joint space, right? It's not this where it's wearing on a pad that's lubricated. It's not that at all. Not at all. That's an old, outdated model that's damaging. They make the hip replacements like that. But then if you look at how a person with the hip replacement moves, yes, it took them out of a lot of pain. You know, and it's made them mobile again, but it's not how the joints work. Yeah. Well, they're going to push the pathology around. Yep. <laughs> Excuse me. They'll push, push them, you know, so someplace else will compensate, but not necessarily because tensegrity, you know, and then there's a, even in writing, people say, oh, well, I have one leg shorter than the other. By how much? Because you walk okay. Like, I don't see you with a, a platform on one foot. I mean, there are people who really do, right? And But they'll use that as an excuse. Um, your body's muscle and tendon and, you know, soft tissue will compensate for these tiny little differences that some doctor told you you have. It's, don't worry about it. You'll balance. It'll balance. Hey, so maybe, <laughs> so this, uh... I love writing, but I have like very limited experience. I just really, really love it. So, but when I, the few times that I've ridden, it feels, you know, when I get off the horse, I feel stretched out, you know, like from my hip down, you know, through my feet. And maybe that's, that, that stretching is, and moving is part of why I feel better after riding, huh? Because I, I wonder if it has to do with, because the body balances, right? If you didn't fall on your face, you're balanced. But you can be crumpled up in some horrible posture and yeah. still be balanced. When yeah. you add the inputs from the horse, the horse is putting big forces through your body. And if your body finds a balance there that's a neutral balance that minimizes the forces, allows them to push straight through, um, that that's probably what's helping especially if so unfortunate <laughs> right so it's the dynamic balance you the the autopilot is balancing you but yeah if you're lucky enough that it that riding helps you because there's a lot of riders even at higher levels that are getting pain back pain from riding but there are saddles that are terrible so if you're riding in a saddle that feels comfortable, like a chair, uh-uh. Yeah. Those are the ones that are killing people. You want to ride in a minimal, minimal saddle. So you can balance. If you have a saddle pushing on you, right. you know, they have the saddles with the high, it's called the cantle behind you, so it's a deep seat. You feel like you're sitting in a bowl. So that's pushing on the back of you. And then there's big knee rolls in the front, so those are supporting you there. Now you're fixed, and you don't have the options to balance. Huh. That's hurting a lot of riders. It's huh. hurting a lot of riders. Interesting. Yeah. You it's can ride in one of those saddles, but you have to stay away from the things that want to restrict you. You know, it's hard. I, when I first start, got back into horses, a very nice lady trainer, in Iowa invited me to come out to a what's called a hunter pace basically everybody jumping around a cross-country course together <laughs> um, so she let me ride her comp two of her competition horses on that in a deep seated saddle with knee pads knee rolls so I was stuck in this position and, oh, I could not walk I could really? not walk when I got off the horse uh-uh I was fighting the saddle my body was fatigued after that just from fighting for my own balance huh. so I am used to the saddles that are just flat seats no knee rolls just bare minimum close contact so when I met my current um, biomechanics teacher uh, he came to my farm for a clinic 
And I, I ba basically begged him, please, please don't make me buy one of those dressage saddles. And I said, I can't stand them. I can't ride in them. And he smiled. He said, oh, wait till you see my saddle. <laughs> so I did, I did go take lessons on. He had a nice, beautiful, great big horse that he had rehabilitated, and he was teaching lessons on him. Um, and I, wrote, I went and rode a few lessons on his horse, but his dressage saddle was just like an old jumping saddle, flat, flat seat, no big nothing to hold you in place. Oh, I ended up buying one. Very nice saddle. So, yes, and that, cool. that helps a lot. Yeah, fun. <laughs> Woohoo! So now we're pretty much up to current days, and um, we will have to, I, I think, catch up a little further another time. But he okay. Okay. So much. This has just been absolutely oh, lovely. Um, you're most welcome. I'm thrilled. And um, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, what is the best way for them to do that? Oh, I think probably the horsept.com website. And then there's contact information on there, and they can poke through yep. what I've got populated on there so far. But yeah, she's got some interesting stuff there. Um, so it's literally just spelled out H O R S E P T dot com. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. And if anybody needs to reach me, it's honeybeebuzz.marketing, but Paige LaBella and horsept.com. Thanks, Paige. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.